the Sync My Music podcast. I have a very special guest for you guys today. Uh, it is Mark Freezer, and if you don't know who Mark Freezer is, he actually is the creator, founder, and operator of Sync Summit. You've probably heard that term. It's definitely been a very powerful um, conference that's actually centered 100% on sync licensing. It started in 2013, so it's been successfully running now for, I guess, six years, a little over six years. And uh, it's now grown to the point where it's international. There are actually conferences in Japan, in New York, and there's one actually coming up here in LA in just a few days. And Mark reached out to me actually just the other day and invited me to speak on one of the panels at the LA um, conference that's coming up, the Sync Summit conference. So uh, I was very honored uh, to be invited to that and I got to learn a lot more about Sync Summit and what's going on with this uh, with this conference. Uh, if you guys have been following me for a while, you know that I haven't gone to many uh, conferences uh, regarding Sync licensing, mostly just because I've had really great experiences just directly pitching to people online, sometimes even through Facebook. So I've really been more of a digital uh, networker in my career, but I do know that showing up and being there in person, there's a huge value add to that to meet the people on the other side of the equation when we're in this industry. So um, I wanted to introduce you guys to Mark and I want him to basically explain to us what Sync Summit is all about. And most importantly, why is it relevant for producers and composers? Because as he'll explain, Sync Summit um, brings together all the different players in the sync licensing business. So we have content creators, music supervisors, music library and catalog owners, and people like me, composers, artists, bands, and, and um, producers, right? So it is basically a melding of the minds. And what I love about that approach is that it really does emphasize that this is a team sport that usually, probably 99% of the time, we cannot do this on our own, especially as composers and producers. And I've certainly told you guys that this is why I've always told you to partner directly with music libraries because they handle so much of the heavy lifting in terms of uh, marketing, sales, uh, whining and dining clients, finding opportunities for your music, organizing things, building the catalog, metadata, uh, artwork. I mean, there's so much stuff that goes into actually getting your music from your studio to on a TV show that most of us, you know, there's 24 hours in the day. We just don't have the resources or the time to be able to do everything. And so I love partnering with music libraries. And so talk, talking with Mark and chatting with Mark the other day really opened my eye up to um, potentially how valuable something like Sync Summit could really be for you guys. So Mark, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself. Let us know a little bit about your background, your history uh, in the music biz and what Sync Summit is all about. Why, you, why did you create it? And what's the fundamental um, value that it adds to the business? Okay, great. Well, first of all, Jesse, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be on your podcast. It's a real, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a real honor to uh, be here and to uh, talk to everybody uh, out there on the internet and in the world. And um, I'm delighted to have the chance to talk to you a little bit about why we started Sing Summit. And first, a little bit about me. Um, I've been working uh, mainly in technology and music for really since almost since I can remember. Uh, I um, my first official my first official work as a um, person in the music industry was as a music journalist at the age of 17. But I'll fast forward up until uh, recently. I worked in uh, mobile music back when ringtones were uh, something uh, between 2000 and 2005, and then uh, in 2012. Um, I had the idea of getting into um, the uh, sync licensing industry because basically I I looked at what the future in my eyes was for the music industry and I thought, well, where are the areas where people can really get their music out and have an impact? Because basically, if you're looking to build your career and building and, and monetize your music. There's only a few ways to do it today. Really, you know, we talk about streaming as a way of monetization, but it's uh, it's difficult. So when I looked at the music industry, I thought, okay, there's licensing, there's merchandising, there's live. These are three things that I think are good for the future. And I thought, okay, in all of those, I can have an impact doing something in licensing. So I wanted to start up a sync licensing company. And as, I looked at the marketplace. I thought, you know, there's no, there's nothing out there that's bringing people together to talk about how to do business in this business, how to do, how to do licensing deals, how to get your music into a TV show or into a film or into a game or on an app or in an ad. Nobody was really out there doing an event that I thought really had 
uh, the potential to answer questions that are in a lot of people's minds. And just in general, I wanted to bring the industry together to talk about, you know, how do we do business in this market and what the future of the business is. And that was the genesis of Sync Summit. So we did our first Sync Summit in um, June of 2013 uh, here in New York, where I'm based. And uh, then it expanded from there, really based on a sort of organic market need. You know, and, and I would say that that goes from people who are everywhere from artists and producers to people who are label executives to music supervisors and sync agents and production companies, the people in the ecosystem who wanted to get the word out, but also connect with each other and help each other learn how they can do business and collaborate and grow the industry and grow their careers. So that's the basic mission that we've had with this event. Um, we've grown it internationally. So as you said, Jesse, we have it in New York, in Nashville, in Los Angeles. Uh, we partner with an event in Singapore that's called Music Matters. We do a part of our a part of that event, and we call it Sync Matters. So it's a little bit of a conglomeration. We just did our first Sync Summit Tokyo, which we'll get back to, I'm sure, in our conversation. And we also work putting on Sync panels with a variety of other events across the world, like Canadian Music Week, as well as FIMPRO, which is an event in Guadalajara, and All About Music, which is an event that takes place in Mumbai. So. And all of those, my mission, my personal mission has been to go out there and to help people who want to put their best foot forward and bringing their music out to the world and actually learning what it takes to get your music into uh, some kind of visual media. Absolutely. I like that. And I actually didn't realize you were in so many different uh, cities. So I'm, I'm outdated on my info. So you're even further okay. out. Uh, all yeah. over in the world. So that's great. Um, so what I love and what Mark and I really, we, we had a phone call uh, just last week. And what I think we really bonded on is we share the same philosophy in terms of education, because I think there are a lot of services and platforms out there that are more than willing to take your money and potentially try to shop your music for you or promise you they're going to give you all these connections, but they don't actually give you the tools to actually succeed um, and actually provide you with education to be able to become a, a valuable inner circle member and have direct relationships in this industry. So there are a lot of, I'll just call them predatory offers that are out there uh, that take advantage of this sort of uh, ignorance, basically, of new coming producers into this industry. And so from what I was hearing with why Mark started Sync Summit, it really directly mirrored everything that I, the reason why I created Sync My Music and why I put together all the videos and now the podcast and everything that I do for you guys is because I wanna give you those tools to create direct relationships with the people that can get your tracks placed and not have you reliant on predatory middleman services that are charging you monthly fees to, you know, oh, well, well, we might be able to get you some placements, but you gotta keep those fees coming every single month. And you have no idea what's really happening. And most importantly, you have no direct contacts to anybody in the business. You're basically just kind of the sucker out there paying all these fees and really not knowing what's in it for you and what you're gonna be getting down the long run. So I like that Mark and I share the same philosophy of giving the, um, the producer the fishing pole and the bucket and showing them how to fish rather than just handing them a bucket of fish. We want you guys to be able to have a long-term, sustainable 20, 30, 40, 50 year long career. And that just doesn't come from forking out a couple of bucks to some shopping company um, who's not gonna educate you for how to actually do this um, uh, by yourself, okay? So I, I love that we sort of shared that philosophy for how to really equip people with that knowledge. So Mark, if you can basically talk to us about if a producer or a composer were to come to a Sync Summit event, what do some of the conversations look like? What are some of the topics? Maybe some of the speakers, if you want to talk about maybe some of the upcoming speakers for this event or previous speakers you've had, some notable ones that might be really engaging or interesting for a composer or a producer to know about. Just what can they really expect when they walk in the door, sit down, listen to the panels? Um, what can they walk away from at the end of one of these events? Okay. Well, those are some great questions, Jesse. And I think the first thing that I'll start with is by saying that one of the things that I try to do personally is to make sure that everybody who comes to the event doesn't come in cold. And what I mean by that is, I would say right about now, we start to send to people a list of who's attending, and not their contact information, but basically their name, their title, and their company. And what we say to people is like, look, 
here's who's attending. You tell us who you would like to make a connection with while you're at the event, and we'll do our best to connect you to those people. And we'll do we'll sort of act as matchmakers for people so that when they come in, they actually have had some conversations with people beforehand, had an email exchange so that they're not just coming in blind. That's number one. And that's something that I haven't found at any other event. And I basically did because I wanted to make it meaningful both for the people that are attending and for the people that are on the stage. Because, you know, believe it or not, if you do it in the right way, music supervisors, you know, they 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 do want to, they do want to connect with people and they do want to engage with people. But the way that a lot of events do it, they do it as a, a sort of a controlled free-for-all or just a free-for-all, where everybody's just running around pitching, you know, giving people uh, flash drives, etc. But by doing something in advance where we're able to help people, excuse me, <clears throat> where we're able to help people to understand who's there and why it's important for them to connect with certain people, not just music supervisors, but as you said, production companies, um, label representatives, managers, each other, which is really important. And of course, sync agents, which we'll get to the good and bad and ugly of. Um, and all of those people, I think, are, you know, accessible if you connect people in the right way. So that's number one. Uh, number two, in terms of the people that are speaking, we've had really just about almost every prominent music supervisor you can think of that has spoken at the event. Uh, at this one, just off the top of my head, we've got some really amazing people. I think in terms of music supervision, um, we have Amanda Thomas. Uh, Amanda Thomas is, um, she's an incredible music supervisor. She does Pose, she does American Horror Story, and a host of other shows. Uh, we have a guy named uh, Matt Sullivan, who I think is amazing. He's an executive music producer, so he's a little bit of music supervisor plus, because he's also a composer and an arranger and a scorer for really huge films. He did uh, Beauty and the Beast a couple of years ago with Disney, and he just got off of doing um, West Side Story with Steven Spielberg. So we're going to speak about that. You know, it's he's somebody like if you want to take an example where people who come to the event can really learn from because he is a composer and he really wants to help people to succeed and to understand what it takes to work in the field and to come up in it. You know, those are the kinds of people that I really get excited about having, not just the music supervisors, but the people who are actually practicing the craft and implementing it in some kind of visual media. Uh, in addition to that, we've got Chase Butters from... Um, from Deutsche LA, and he's a music supervisor there. Uh, we've got Allison Litton, who I've done a lot of work with. She is a music supervisor at um, Inaudible Productions, who does all the, um, they do all of the music supervision for all of the uh, legendary pictures films. So that means Godzilla, it means Pokemon, and basically everything that you can think of that they do, Pacific Rim, things like that. In addition to that, <clears throat> we have a variety of people across different competencies from major production companies, so production music companies, to um, other music supervisors um, and um, sync agencies, people from labels, people from publishers, people from performing rights agencies. And of course, we also have composers and artists who were telling their story of how they've done what they do as composers that are working in the field or as people who have grown a catalog and been able to successfully do it themselves, go out and meet music supervisors, which is not easy, and get the knowledge necessary from things like our events, but also just from going out there and learning and um, becoming successful as their own advocates. So that's what you're going to see at the event, I think, in general. And then in terms of specific topics, we're going to talk about things that I think are important for people to know that aren't just, okay, so how do I pitch my music to somebody? Because that's always in the back of people's minds, but <clears throat> that question is best answered by saying, how can I be a problem solver for the people I'm trying to get my music to? And what that means is, first and foremost, 
you need to know what it is that a music supervisor goes through when they're doing their job. Like, who do they answer to? Who's their ultimate boss? Who are the people that they need to help them? Whether it's an artist individually, whether it's a production company, whether it's a sync agency, a label, a publisher, all of these are in the ecosystem of their go-to people. And you need to know that as a producer or as an independent artist or composer, you need to know who is it that exactly these people like work with and why, and how can you connect yourself to the people that they go to and how can you ultimately help them to solve problems in their work? I think that's really important and that's one topic we're gonna cover. In addition to that, we're gonna focus on production music libraries, and we're gonna talk about how production music libraries work, how you can work with them, what the good and bad points are of working with them, and what kinds of deals uh, are out there, what are the best types of deals in terms of the way they're structured, what you should and shouldn't do, things like, you know, should you do work for hire, should you give your rights away on the writers and publishing side? I would, of course, say no, unless there are some really strict conditions, but basically I'd always say no to that. But we'll have people there who can make the argument either way. In addition to that, um, we'll talk about, um, we'll have individual case studies with music supervisors where they'll talk about uh, what their work is and how they've connected music to picture and how they have done it from a creative level and a process level. We'll also talk about intellectual property issues, which are super, super important for people to understand. And you don't have to be your own lawyer, but you have to be able to understand enough of the law so that you can say, okay, you know what? I took a look at this. This isn't good. I'm going to have a lawyer look at it and tell me, you know, what do we need to do to fix it? That's super important to know. And then we'll have a discussion about technology because everybody has to look at technology in terms of how it can be helpful to you, not just in sync, but in music in general and what to, you know, what to look out for in order to use it properly, what kinds of things like metadata and tagging you need to do in order to have people see and listen to your music. So these are a lot of the things that we're gonna do. And finally, we're gonna have, um, we're gonna have as one of our keynotes, and I'm very excited about this, a music supervisor named Morgan Rhodes. And Morgan uh, has done a lot of television and film. Uh, for example, she did the uh, music supervision for Selma, and she did the music supervision for Dear White People. She just is finishing up, I think, Space Jam 2. And she's gonna, uh, we're giving her, uh, in association with Women in Music, a um, award that we're calling the Woman of the Year Award that is specifically geared towards recognizing the contributions and of um, outstanding achievement for women in music supervision, because I think it's important that we do that in the music industry. And she's going to be our first recipient. So we're going to have a networking reception and a uh, ceremony for that. So anybody who comes to the Sync Summit is going to benefit from all of these things. And there's one more thing that I'll, or two more things that I'll say that if you come to the Sync Summit, one of the other things that we do is we put an EPK together uh, for everybody that lives, <clears throat> I'm so sorry about my throat today, <clears throat> but um, we put together an EPK on the website that lives on the website forever, that every single person who attends uh, gets to have on the website. So that way, if you're having a conversation with any of these people that I've talked about afterwards or even before or during, there's a reference point for them that's outside of you know your other reference points so that they can go to Sync Summit and they can get a quick sort of snapshot of you, your career, your links, et cetera. And that's also another thing that most events don't do. And again, we do that because I wanna make sure that the people who come to our event have the ability to get their music out there to the people that are speaking and attending. And then afterwards, the other thing that we do is we finish up by giving you a list of all of the people that have attended, along with their contact information, unless they specifically tell us not to give you your contacts. Uh, but um, if, um, it, most of the time they'll give us their contacts. We give that to you so that afterwards you can really make a connection directly from the conversations that you've had and the people that you've met. So that's a big nutshell. 
but that's basically what you're going to get if you come to Sync Summit. Yeah, that's very unique. I've never heard of a um, conference where they're connecting people beforehand and then giving you guys the ability to connect afterwards and obviously throwing your info up there online. Um, so there's a lot of really uh, value added that you're definitely doing that I have not seen in any other uh, conference, which is really cool. And I think what that probably does do is it creates a fostering uh, a community, right? It's not just like, yeah. okay, a bunch of random people getting together in a room, hanging out for a couple of days and then see you later. Um, there's a sense of people kind of know each other before they walk in there. And so it's just warmer. People are able, uh, able to just walk up and talk to people, uh, you know, can have a cocktail with somebody. And it's just, it's a little bit more friendly, I think, than maybe something that's a little bit more corporate corporate and stiff. Um, and obviously, yeah. as you guys can hear from what Mark was saying, that we completely both are agreeing on your need to become a, a serviceable person in this industry. You have to learn how to empathize with the needs of music supervisors and libraries and people that need your music. You, right. you know, most, so, most producers don't think about that at all. They literally are just focused on what music they want to make and they can see their music landing on a car commercial. So they're just spamming their stuff all over the place, but they have no empathy or consideration for what's life like on the other end of this receiving email. If I were a music library CEO or a supervisor or anybody looking for music, what are my needs? What do I look for? What would make my life a lot easier? And just like Mark said, how can you be a problem solver for the other side of the equation? Um, and this is all telling you guys that this is a team sport. So you need to learn how to get along with other people, be a likable person, be a person that people want to work with. Um, and that's also going to be very, very interesting for me on the panel that I'm on, because I'll also be sharing the stage with the uh, creator of Amper. And Amper is an, an AI music creation tool, which is, I've gotten emails about that so many times. And that's why I'm so um, interested to get on stage. And, and actually, I want to learn a lot about what they're doing, because so many composers are worried that our jobs are pretty much about to be obsolete as soon as these AI, you know, music creating tools are out there for, um, um, you know, uh, TV producers, film producers yep. to actually have their hands on. So I want to learn a lot about that topic as well. Um, and the more that these tools are going to be coming out there online, the better that we, the human beings, right, the actual humans out here, the better that we have to get at actually making people's lives easier. Because if it's between you and a machine and the machine gets things done every time, on time, much cheaper, we have to work a lot harder to prove our worth in this industry. So I definitely will bring you guys all the insights uh, that I learned from that. Um, and also uh, regarding the Sync Summit um, event that I'm going to be speaking at, I will do a full review for you guys here. And I'll probably just release it as another podcast a week or two after the event. And I'll give you guys the full breakdown of the um, experience that I have and what I learned. And I'll give you guys basically the entire rundown of what I feel um, this this uh, summit and this conference actually brought to me just personally as a composer. And certainly because I'm an educator, I want to bring that to you guys as well. So Mark has been very uh, generous in allowing me to do that. And also filming, I want to film my particular um, uh, speaking uh, panel. So you guys will be able to watch that as well and I'll probably release that on my uh, YouTube channel. So thank you so much for that, Mark. Now let's get into sync agents. This is that big topic that I, before you and I talked, I had this uh, conception of sync agents as pretty much just sharks, pretty much just scammers, unethical people that were taking advantage of newbies, of newcomers, uh, because that's all I really saw online. I've, I've released many videos on my YouTube channel and I try to expose these kind of weird offers that are out there. One of the most recent ones was somebody trying to charge a composer $1,500 per month plus 10% of any fee that they earned by getting their songs placed. You had to commit to 12 months and there was a 60 day cancellation window. I mean, it was so, so predatory, it was ridiculous. But Mark, when we talked on the phone last week, he basically opened my eyes up to the fact that there are legitimate sync agents out there. And so what I wanna do in this uh, conversation is actually learn a lot from Mark because he's been experienced in this field. He actually has a sync agency um, company himself. And he's gonna basically show us and tell us what we should be looking out for, what constitutes something that should be potentially a red flag, you should probably stay away from it, and what signs are that somebody is actually legit, they have something they can actually offer you, and also the pros and cons of working with a sync agent maybe versus a library or trying to do it all on your own. So why don't we start with the basics, Mark? Why don't you go ahead and give us a, a brief overview of what a sync agent is and what service do they provide for a composer like myself or like any of my listeners watching? Okay, well, um, for sync agents, basically what they do is they work as, going back to this term that we all hate, they work as a middleman between the music supervisor and the music creator or the music owner. So a sync agent can work with, on the um, ownership side, they can work as an agent for a label, a publisher, a management company, an individual producer, an individual uh, writer, an artist, or band. So they can work with anybody who makes 
or administers the rights to music. That's sort of that's their that's their clientele. On the other side, obviously, there are people who are the decision makers, whether it's uh, a music supervisor, an executive producer, a brand manager, somebody at a studio, uh, somebody at a game company uh, who's involved in pulling together music for productions. That's what a sync agent does is they sit in the middle back and forth between the um, people who have the music and the people who want the music. That's the most basic thing. Now, um, why would people who want music go to a um, sync agency? Well, a lot of music supervisors, when they want to license music, one of the things that they want to do is they want to go to people that they know, that they understand know the intellectual property side of the business and the process side of the business. And that's a lot of things that, you know, there's a lot of gears to make that work. So, you know, having somebody who you know, who you've done business with, who can make sure that the rights are properly uh, settled for any track that, you know, they've had the conversation with the artist or the other company about what the splits are. So there's not going to be any big hiccups and actually sits as somebody that's a reliable source for getting a deal done and getting music uh, to somebody for a project and doing it quickly. So that's a lot of the reason why music supervisors will go to sync agencies. Um, but when you talk about sync agencies, there's an awful lot of difference between a legit sync agency and an agency, <clears throat> excuse me, and an agency that really isn't uh, legit. And first of all, I, I'm just jumping right into this, Jesse, because that's the basic, you know, a sync agent is pretty easy to describe. Basically, it's somebody who sits in the middle and does the deals. Now, um, what separates a good agency from a bad agency? Well, first of all, I think first and foremost, uh, somebody who wants to be your advocate, somebody who's gotten into this business to help artists. And also, you know, they're running a business, but they also, they want to help artists and helping artists does not mean that, you know, you're going to ask an artist for 1500 a month that just goes into the ether and 10% of the back end. That really is, to me, a no-win situation for anybody that's getting involved. And that's very different from saying, like, let's say that you're setting up a website, and as part of setting up your website, you know, you, you're you not a web person, and you say, okay, I'm going to find somebody to consult with me, and then they'll help me with the metadata and help me to organize everything. Yeah, of course, you're going to do a deal, and you're going to figure out how to – uh, how to how to hire somebody to do that for you. But there's a very big difference in a practical project where there's an outcome and you're paying for it and somebody who's just coming to you and saying, give me $1,500 a month, sign a contract with me where I'm going to have exclusivity in everything that you have. I'm going to take 10% of whatever you're taking as well. And um, you have no idea what's going on. Like that is an absolute no. And that's one of the worst, most predatory things that I've heard, Jesse. And that's why it's like when I saw that video, I was like, I'm reaching out to him because we really have this sort of common frame of mind that we need to educate people that this is not how the business is done. And, um, you know, I've also had a lot of friends of mine who are artists who will come to me, you know, and say, Mark, what do you think of this deal? And I look at it and it might not be quite as predatory as that one where they're asking for a ton of money up front, but they are asking for some money. And maybe it's a lump sum or maybe it's a smaller amount per month or something like that with no real work on their part. Other than that, they say that they're going to take your music and they're going to put it in sort of a pile and then maybe it'll get used by somebody and then they'll also take a percentage. And, you know, the way that I look at that, Jesse, is like um, I'm going to bring up a financial term from, you know, the crash 10 years ago. There was something that really caused the crash called a credit default swap, right? And a credit default swap was basically taking lots of different mortgages, good and bad and ugly, mostly ugly, and throwing it into a pile and then saying, okay, now I'm going to sell this as a new commodity. What a lot of people do is they take your music and they do the same thing. Basically, what they'll do is they'll say to you, hey, give me your music. We're going to do this deal, whether it's good or bad or whatever. And they're going to throw it into a pile. And then they're going to go to somebody like a Viacom or, you know, ESPN, whoever it is, and say, hey, I've got this pile here for you. And I'm going to basically 
do a licensing deal with you where you're going to pay me money in order to get access to this pile here. Some of it's good. Some of it, we don't even know what's in it. And, you know, you guys can sort it out. And then maybe if perhaps something happens down the line, there will be some kind of weird accounting where it'll end up at the end that you end up getting sent a check for a few dollars. And there are some sort of unicorns in that where, yeah, maybe you'll do well, but you have no idea of who's doing what with your music. And that's horrible too. So it's not just the people who are asking for money, but it's the people who have this sort of opacity in the deals that they're doing or not doing for you. And you don't want to work with anybody like that. So that's basically the way that I've the way that I've seen a lot of these things come through. And there's a bit and and I'll also say one other thing is that music supervisors don't like to, typically don't like to work with companies that are like that. They actually come from music, love music, are musicians and they want they really do want to help people as much as they can get their music out to the world. So they try to work with people who not only can help them to get deals done well, but also people who are advocates for musicians and for the people that serve musicians and we can get into that a little bit more but i i hope that gives you an idea of where i sit in terms of my mindset and where i see sync agencies and everyone else in terms of who's good and who's bad so we can talk about what a good sync agent is in a second but i just wanted to pause for a second and see if there was anything that you know you wanted to get into based on <laughs> what i've said the last 5 minutes Absolutely. And I, I appreciate you clearing that up for me. And I think I do want to just dovetail on one thing you said, which is when you have a business structure, let's just go to that $1,500 a month ridiculous offer. You guys yeah. have to realize that when you get offered something like that and, and they're taking 10% of the back end, if they're making $1,500 off of you a month, do they have, and they're, and they're requiring a 12 month contract. Okay. It's not like you can just cancel after a month if you don't get any placements. No, you are yeah. locked in. So think about, again, this is about empathy. Empathy doesn't mean that you're always thinking about the, the positive side of them, but think about what incentivizes this person to actually hustle for you, right? So you're right. already paying them no matter what. If they, fall, if they take your music and throw it in the trash, if they take your music and never even listen to it, or if they take your music and email it to a couple of people, they get that $1,500 a month every single month. It doesn't matter. They could do nothing. They could literally do nothing. They got you under contract and they're good. So, and they only take a 10% fee on the back end, which seems kind of small, but they're probably making, they probably make more actually with that $1,500 than they would ever make probably on a 10% placement fee, unless you got some massive, you know, six figure placement or something like that. But they're making, you know, 12, 13, 15 grand a, a year off of you. And so you got to think about that as well. Like if you're going to shell out that kind of money to somebody, and just like Mark says, they're not going to show you what they're doing. They're not going to give you like a, a weekly report of who your tracks were sent out to or what they're doing with it. Um, I had one member actually who he uh, only paid a couple of hundred dollars to somebody doing something like this and hadn't heard anything for a couple of months, emailed this guy and said, hey, what's going on with my music? I gave you a couple hundred bucks, I, what's happening? And the guy told him, if you bother me again, I'll blacklist you out of the industry. Okay, so that's what's happening out there. That's what a lot of these people are doing. That is so insane, man. It, it's I mean, crazy, sorry, it's crazy. Jeff, but that is insane. And, it, and it's just always sad because I know that if, if producers had more education and just maybe watched a podcast or a video like this, they would know to just immediately put them on the block list. Don't even respond to them. Just go away. Or actually, more importantly, guys, email me because you guys know that I expose this stuff and I put it on my YouTube channel. That's one of the big benefits of having my channel and my podcast is I can let you guys know about a lot of the predatory things. And unfortunately, in the music business and on planet Earth, a lot of predatory yeah. people out there. So we have to kind of look out for each other that way. Um, but what I do want to get into is if you were approached by a good sync agent or a sync agency, what does a good deal look like? What would something that if you got offered that or if you heard, if you had a musician friend that was offered and they said, hey, you know, Mark, this is what they're offering me. And you actually said, hey, actually, that's a fair offer. What would that kind of a deal look like? That's a, that's a really good question. And, you know, it's it's interesting. Like I, I was having, uh, I, I, I had, um, I had a conversation yesterday with somebody who is a uh, sync agency as well. It's a company called Low Pro Profile. I'll give them a little plug because I think they're great. Uh, the CEO, Jen Pierce, her and I sort of share common ground on this. We were talking about what comprises a good deal and a bad deal. And basically, there's a few things that you need to consider. The first thing is, what is the person going to be incentivized by to be your advocate? And how much incentives should you give them or not give them? Now, everybody might have a different take on this slightly, but my, my thing is, first and foremost, 
nobody's going to have a different take on this who's legit, which is that you should only give them a percentage of something that they earn. So if they do a deal for you, then they should get a percentage of something. I think that everybody can say that's fair. If somebody brings you $10,000 and they do all the paperwork and the networking, sure, if you want to give them 20 to 30% of that, I think that that's a fair thing to ask. I think once you get above 30, it gets to be a little questionable. Once you get to 50, then to me, if you go past that, it gets to be predatory because I think that you know, you're the rights owner, you created the music, and the person who's sort of shepherding it through to the music supervisor deserves to get paid if they get you money, but they shouldn't be taking the lion's share. And there are some companies that do that. And they'll, you know, I'll, I'll be fair. They'll argue that, Mark, I don't really think you're right. I, we do a lot of work in order to get that deal, blah, blah, blah. But where I sit and where I think most people I know sit, it's sort of in the 20 to 30 percent range, which basically says, OK, we're going out there. We're being your advocate. We're pitching, but we're also making sure that all the rights are settled and they're clear. And we're working with the music supervisor, which, believe it or not, is an enormous amount of work. Like you'll have a music supervisor ask for something and you'll end up going down a rabbit hole with them as they're looking and refining their music search, et cetera. And I'll tell you something about seven times out of 10 times, they end up not using anything. So the music, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that, you know, a, a good sync agent has to go through with a music supervisor to get something done. So they do a lot of, I think, important work in their advocacy and their representation. So that's deserved if, I mean, it's deserved that they get, that they get a portion of um, what they bring in. Now, some people will ask you for things like um, a share of the publishing fee or the back, or let's just say a share of the back end in one way or another. It could be, you know, your royalties, it could be a portion of your publishing fee, a portion of your writer's fee, whatever it is. I personally don't ask for that because I think that that belongs to the artist. The only time that that would be an exception for me, and I'm just speaking for myself, is if I was working with an artist more closely and I went and I spent my own money to develop the track with them. And then I'd say, okay, well, this is a different business structure because we're partners together on the music itself rather than me just representing you. And the other exception would be if we did a deal with a company, and this does happen from time to time, where they're not paying any upfront fee and they're giving you promotion in lieu of an upfront fee. So basically there's like, there's a lot of TV networks that'll do this where they'll say, look, we're not going to give you uh, like an upfront fee for this, but we're going to put your name on uh, the screen for five seconds and we're going to put a URL where you can access the music. Now on a deal like that, I would probably get in touch with the artist and I would say, look, here's the, here's the deal that's out there. We should maybe we should think about maybe structuring this where we get a percentage of the back end just for this specific deal, not in perpetuity for the track, not in everything you do, but just for this specific deal because the structure is different. And that's really what comes out of working together is that, you know, you look at every deal together and you say, is this right for you? Like I most of the most of the people and companies that I represent as a sync agent, um, some of them I can't do one-stop deals with, which means like I can automatically say that the publishing and the and the master side are cleared because um, they're big labels. And with a big label, everything is like, we'll take a quick turnaround, but we'll have to talk about it and we'll have to go through the deal. And that ends up being my philosophy throughout, even if I'm dealing with an individual artist. I don't go to individual artists like, you just have to give me everything and then I'll, do, I'll deal with it. No, what I do is when, whenever I have a deal come through, We'll have, a, we'll have a conversation about it. And it might not be a conversation as long as we're having right now, Jesse. It might just be a couple of emails where I'm like, look, this is the structure of it, the opportunity. Are you good with this? And then after that, we'll say, okay, so we'll do the deal. We'll get the deal done and we'll just uh, you know, bring it to completion. And that, <clears throat> that to me is you know, something that you really have to look for. Is this going to be a company that's going to really have a dialogue with you over time and work with you? You really should require that from somebody. And, you know, it doesn't mean that they're going to be ca calling you every day or that you should be calling them every day, but you have a dialogue with them and you know that when it's important, you will get answers. There's a lot of people out there who just will leave you once they've gotten your music or once they've 
you know, gotten your money, whatever it is, you know, depending on whether it's a good or bad person uh, or an indifferent person. And you don't want to, you don't want to be in that position, right? You want to be, you want to feel like somebody actually cares. And, you know, I think that's important when you're looking for a good sync agent. Now, one of the other things that you have to look at is exclusivity versus non-exclusivity. Because a lot of sync agents, and, you know, some of my friends will say this, you know, I want to have exclusivity. I personally don't ask for exclusivity with somebody unless going back to the exception I made before, it, you know, you've actually partnered with an artist to produce a track. Then it's like, yeah, okay, that's, you know, I'm, I'm invested in this. I want it just to be for us. But outside of that, if uh, somebody's working as your agent, as an artist, it pays for you to go for being non-exclusive in my eyes, because you want to be able to work with a few different people, not too many. You don't want to be with 20 people, but you want to have the right to be your own advocate if you, if you need to be. And in addition, what if you want to say, okay, you know what? This guy's really good with television and film, and this woman here is really good with advertising. Maybe what I can do is I can just say, okay, I'm going to have this person work that side of the market and this person work that side because they're actually very different uh, competencies. And some people only work exclusively with ads. Some people only work exclusively with TV and film, and some people work with both. In addition, there are some people that are more connected to the international market, and maybe you'll wanna have somebody that represents you internationally. So you need to think these things through when you're looking at exclusivity, because I don't think there's one company that will have all the answers for you and be able to help you with everything. Now, I'll tell you what the other side of this is, and then we, and then I'll, and then I'll go, we can go to the next, uh, we can go to some questions, but um, the other side of it, to be fair to the people who ask for exclusivity, is that they say that people um, who are exclusive are able to give the music supervisor an extra level of um, assurance that the rights are clear, that there's only one person representing it, that there aren't gonna be any conflicts. I see that to a degree, to be fair, but a very small degree because it's pretty sure, you know, when you do a deal, you do a deal. Basically, there's a piece of paper somewhere that says a deal was done for the music for a specific term. And that need not be exclusive or non-exclusive. Um, it just needs to be done the right way. So when I'm looking at this as somebody who wants to be an advocate for artists, I always say to artists, you know, great, we're happy to represent you, but also, you know, if you want to have one or two other companies represent you, I'm fine with that. I just want to see it so that, you know, it's not something that's in direct conflict with what we're doing so that we're constantly like at the same time, every time a serve, every time we're like bringing up music, we're competing with somebody. That's probably the only thing that I would think. So you wouldn't want that either because it doesn't help you. Um, and then there's a bunch of other things I can talk about in terms of what works for, um, you know, good sync agents versus bad sync agents, but I'll stop now and see if you have any questions. Yeah, I like where you, where you left it off there. I think I, one thing I want to clarify on, though, what is your take on any sync agent charging an upfront fee? Like it could be a monthly or a lump sum. Where is your line that you might draw on that to say what's predatory? Uh, is it any sync fees or any, I'm not sync fees, any fees charged up front you would think is not really acceptable? Are there certain amounts that you'd feel like there might be some value added if there is a, a fee associated with it? Or what's your take on that? You know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say if you're a big label, and you're asking somebody to, and nobody here is a big label, but I'm just bringing this up as a way to kick this off. If you're a big label and you've got like, let's say 50,000 songs that you want somebody to represent for you, and that person or that company is going to need to do something to organize it properly and put together playlists and make sure that things go out in the right way to music supervisors. Yeah, I'm all for saying, um, you know what, they may have, you may have to ask that, um, that label uh, for uh, some money specifically to consult to get that started. Like that I can see, and I think that's fair. You know, that goes back to what I was saying about like, if somebody's developing a website for you, yeah, sure, you're going to pay them. But when it comes down to doing the basic business of being a sync agent, if all somebody is doing is being an advocate for you, calling, emailing, etc. 
my philosophy is that you shouldn't be paying out a lump sum or a monthly sum to that person or that company. You should be doing something where basically they eat from what they kill. That's the best way I can put it. And, you know, I, I apologize to people who are uh, vegans and vegetarians because I was one for a couple of years. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, it basically like if you're, if you're out there as my advocate, I want you to be like surviving and winning with me rather than directly from me just because I've connected with you. So this goes back to what we were saying about these predatory fees. Um, you don't want anybody who's just going to be like, okay, well, I've taken your money uh, this month or I've taken your money and, you know, that's going to kind of be the end of it philosophically for me. I've got my nut no matter what. Um, you want somebody who is going to be uh, out there um, being your advocate because it helps their business. So a long answer to a short question is uh, I really don't believe in any of these um, upfront fees. I don't think that they make sense. And there are some upfront fees where, you know, I, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take a minute for this. There are some online services where they'll ask for an upfront fee. And the upfront fee may not be an enormous upfront fee. It may, it may be like 10, 12, 20, maybe $30 a month, something like that. And you have to ask yourself the question, what is the value add that I'm getting by paying this fee versus just putting my music on their service or just saying, you know, okay, I'm going to go to another website. Um, and the question, the question always goes back to, okay, uh, what, what, if anything, will paying this extra fee do to connect my music to the people I ultimately want to connect to? And the answer to that is, um, well, it's a real question mark. I mean, I don't think that I, I think there are successes from some of these services and I'm really I'm not going to get into the names of all of them, but you can easily find them online. Um, there are people who have some successes with these services. But again, um, I would say that um, you're paying for their their in-house advocates to talk to music supervisors. That's basically what you're paying for. So you've got like two tiers of people. You've got the people who are just lumped in a big sum on their online service. And then you've got the people who are in the premium area, right? And the people in the premium area actually have people that are going out and pitching individually to music supervisors, the people who are in this sort of higher band. Now, those people in the higher band, they have direct relationships with music supervisors and they're pitching, they're actively pitching music. So the question you want to ask yourself is, you know, is it worth my time to pay this money? Is it worth my money to get these people's time to be my advocate? Um, well, maybe is going to be my answer. Maybe. Um, if I was a musician, would I do it? Um, no, I'd probably try to find a more traditional sync agent. That would probably be my thing, is to say, okay, what do I want to do? Who would I go to, you know, that I think could like my music and be legit? And we can talk about how you go about finding and getting a good sync agent. Um, but I think that, you know, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the online services because I think that they have some value. But those people, as good as some of them can be, they're not your direct advocate. You know, they're sort of working with like a big pile of music and they're not connect, they're not connected directly to you. So you have to keep that into consideration when you're looking at those sorts of services. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we totally agree on that because these are the companies that I've always called as cattle call companies, because yeah. for the most part, there are tens of thousands of producers that are also throwing their music right up on these catalogs and on these websites. And so if you want to be one of 10,000 being considered for an opportunity, that's a great place for you. But as Mark was saying, it is about personal direct relationships with people who are, are going to be your advocate, actually know your name, actually have talked yeah. to you on the phone or emailed with you, have some sort of a personal relationship with you. And you're not just another number, right? You're member number 4,863. You upload your own tracks. They have their FAQ section. They don't even want to talk to you. So it's, it's a much more impersonal approach to the business. And I still think this is obviously a people business. It is a service industry, so you do need to put yourself out there and directly partner with people. I do also agree. I think that directly partnering, that's why my approach and what I've been telling all my subscribers is music libraries. I think that those are the people that that's what my uh, success has been uh, based on is partnering with good music libraries that have been my advocates that have gone out there and the same deal structure. They don't get paid unless I get paid. They don't get their uh, sync fees or their publishing income unless they get me placements. So I love those kind of deals where 
as I'm composing music or as I'm sleeping or walking my dog, I have a team of people around the world, mostly in the US, but now with sub-publishers, I have people all over the world actually being my advocate, trying to get me placements. And I love that because I don't want to do any of that. I hate whining and dining. I don't like all that side of the business. I love just making music. I love educating you guys. So I love that I've been able to partner with people that have been able to take care of that. And regarding the uh, you know the 20 to 30% uh, fee for getting things placed, I think that's more than fair, actually. I would be actually open to 50% myself personally if there were very lucrative opportunities because right. my approach uh, or my, my philosophy is that, yes, it was my music, but at the same time, did I have any chance of getting that placement without this person? Zero, right? I almost had zero chances of getting it. So the fact that Mark is saying this 20 to 30% is where he thinks is fair, I think is actually very, very, very fair, extremely fair actually for us as composers. So I, I couldn't actually endorse that business model more that mm -hmm. we do want to enable people to get rich off of getting us placements. It's absolutely, I think it's one of these mindset things that some producers, especially when we're employees a lot, we're not thinking about this because most of us have never hired anybody else. So we don't know about providing incentives for other people. It's just not something that we're all, uh, we have experience in. But you do want to incentivize those that are representing your music to make money off of it. Because if right. they don't, what gets their butt out of the bed to make phone calls for you or to pitch your music or to put you at the top of the list or you know what what gives them any incentive to actually go out there and do all this work on your behalf nothing so the more you actually want your sync agents or libraries or anybody you're working with you want them to get filthy rich actually off of your music as long as you have a fair share of what you're earning from those deals uh because if they're getting rich guess who else is getting rich that's you you're the one getting these placements you're the one getting these opportunities so absolutely i 100 percent agree with that now i do want to get into one last topic with you um we could talk about certainly how to find sync agents but primarily everybody that's going to be listening to this podcast is going to be somebody like me who's going to be a pretty we we do have artists, we do have bands. I, I know that many of you listening are uh, primarily trying to build your artist career and sync licensing is kind of the secondary uh, consideration right. for you. So I do wanna talk about you guys, but primarily most people listening to this are going to be like me where we 100% focus on sync licensing. We're not doing Spotify, we're not doing iTunes, we're not trying to build a fan base. We could care less about social media, only to the extent of maybe we want to network with people in the sync licensing business, but we're not doing the Instagram, trying to get likes and all that kind of stuff. We, we just sort of bypass all of that. And we just want to get directly to TV placements, movies, commercials, all that kind of stuff. So what would you say in terms of, because um, my, my personal opinion on this is that music libraries are one of the better places for producers and composers like me to approach because A, they have a large variety of clients with a large variety of needs for placements that they that they need music for. Um, and also they um, uh, can help foster relationships to get not only those upfront sync fees for those custom opportunities, but also start getting those back end royalties. So what would be your thoughts in terms of what would be the difference between, uh, let's say a composer listening to this has an album, right? Just 12 tracks, right? We're not talking about a full catalog. We're not talking about a major label. We're talking about one composer with one album 12 tracks, and they want to get some placements uh, with a sync agent. What would you give them in terms of the advice for why they would or wouldn't go with a sync agent versus a music library? Um, maybe some pros and cons between those. Because I want to make sure that those that are listening here understand what a what what role a sync agent could possibly play for them. And I'm sure that there are going to be pros and cons to working with them versus a, a library. Right. Well, I think the thing is, like, first and foremost, you want to make sure that you're in, you're out there in the right places in the ecosystem. And what I mean by that is that if you're working with a production library, that's great. Now, uh, studios, um, game developers, ad firms, they all use different production libraries. Some of them use the same libraries, like you might have someone that use audio network for one thing, they might use APM for another, they might use Extreme for another, and that's all good. Um, and if you can get yourself into like any of those or others, that's a great thing. It's great to be there as a resource um, in that in that library. And um, that is something that, you know, I think almost every music supervisor comes to at one time or another. So that's that's the pros of that. Now, I think that the thing that's good about working with a sync agent is that it's another avenue for you. 
to connect your music to music supervisors. And a lot of music supervisors, the first thing that they'll do is after going to a production music library, they'll go, you know what? I'm not really getting the sound that I want. I need something more specific. So they'll call out to the sync agents that they know and they'll say, listen, you know, I want something that sounds like, uh, like sounds like, Mandarin pop. I've got this much money. I'm not really finding it yet. Do you have anything that you represent from any artists or any labels or any publishers that you work with that could help? And then that's another avenue where if you have something and, you know, it need not be my example. It can be pop. It can be rap. It can be, uh, you know, jazz, anything, whatever they're asking for, a um, sync agent can help to connect to that opportunity. And a lot of times there are music supervisors who will just go straight to a sync agent as their first thing that they go to and then go to a production library later. Usually they're doing a combination of both to be fair. And I just feel like if you're a, um, if you're somebody who's got 12 songs, you know, you're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna find a sync agent who will uh, take you on and work with you in the ways that we talked about, but you're also gonna to wanna to look at production libraries. And one of the things with production libraries that you wanna be sure of, and this is a topic for another conversation really is, you know, what kind of, um, what kind of relationship do you have with the production library? Are they uh, taking everything in as a work for hire? Meaning, are you not getting any back end on the deal? I hope not because, you know, you should, uh, but um, you know, you need to know what the structure of those deals are. Exclusivity versus non-exclusivity is important too, just like you do with the sync agents. Um, but when everything is said and done, my, my main thing to say to you is like, when you're looking at a sync agent, take into mind everything that I talked about. Also take a look and see what they've done. Take a look and see what their success has been if you can. It's not always easy to find out, but you can do some research there. And then on the production library is the same thing. But the bottom line is both of them have value and you should be looking at both of them as ways that can help you to do um, what really isn't your job when it comes down to it, right? Like what you wanna do is you wanna make great music. That's the biggest concern that you should have making great music and making sure and this is the other side you should make sure of making sure that that music is licensable making sure that if you're a band or if you're working with other players you've sat down before you started playing and everybody says oh this is such a hassle for me but it's really a much less of a hassle than what you're going to have to deal with afterwards if you don't do it work out the splits at the beginning before you start playing. You know, it's like, it doesn't get in the way of creativity. It's a 20 minute conversation at best. Everybody agrees. And then that way you've got a record so that if there's something that happens down the line where after something gets licensed, uh, somebody comes back and says, hey, you know, I played on that. You'll be able to say, oh yeah, you played on that and this is your share. Or somebody says, hey, I was in the studio. No, but you didn't do anything. You know, this is, this is something we can go to. And that's really important to have. So you need to have, you know, you need to make sure that that's taken care of as well as making great music. So you've got enough to handle. And basically, if you can have other people, as Jesse said, whether they're libraries or they're sync agencies who are out there doing your business for you, then you're going to win. Then you're going to do well. And it, it's it's going to help you to build your career. Awesome. And then one last uh, point of clarification I want I didn't want to know for myself. So let's say you were to get approached by a composer. They had 12 songs. Now, if that composer went to a library, usually how the library is going to handle it is they're going to like, cool, we like all these songs. Send us full mix, instrumental, we need all the cut downs, we need alt mixes, either we're gonna handle the metadata or here's our Excel sheet, we need you to take care of the metadata. Um, but they'll basically gather all the assets from that composer and put it into their online catalog to be able to shop to their clients. How do you handle that? So let's say somebody comes to you, they got a 12 track album, do you require the assets or do you just get the MP3 mixes and then say when we get a placement, we need those? How do you handle all that? Okay, well the first thing is, you know, when we start doing business together, we need to we need to have the music in a listenable and downloadable form. And that's really important. And what I mean is I'm going to have to ask for the uh, tracks to be streaming 
and I'm going to have to ask for the tracks to be on. It doesn't need to be super high quality, but an MP3. And the reason why is crucial, because if a music supervisor likes that track, then they're going to want to temp it to a video, and they're going to want to show it around to the people that they're collaborating with, because that's sort of how the process is done. It doesn't just get done by a music supervisor listening and going, oh, wow, this is really cool. I'm going to license it. No, that's not how they do their job. They go, oh, this is really cool. Let me download this. I'll temp it to a video, and then I'm going to show it to the editor, to the producer, to the showrunner or the director, to the people that I'm working with, so that everybody can say, hey, does this track work for this? Okay, and then we'll take the next step, which is getting the deal done. So it's super important that you have something where either you just send the MP3s to us, or you give us something where maybe you have it on a link on Disco or Dropbox or Box.com or whatever tool you use so that it's easily listenable to and that the links don't expire. That's super, super important. And also uh, that you've done your best in terms of providing metadata. And if you want to take a look at um, what I think is good metadata, you can go to our blog. There's a couple of articles there that you can look at. One is like syncsummit.com slash blog. You can look for it. Metadata is there. And there's also something there that gets into sync agencies and the good and the bad and the ugly. So if you want to go to those two links, you can check that out. But metadata is super important. Um, in addition to that, how about a little information about yourself? You know, some links, some links to video, uh, maybe, um, you know, something like an EPK. These sorts of things actually are really useful because some music supervisors, if they're really turned on to your music, and this does happen, they're going to be like, who is that, Mark? Like, Give me more. I want to know about the artist. I don't just want to license the track. And that does happen. And it's to your advantage to have that information available for somebody that's your advocate, because who knows, we might be going from something which is just a one time sync because they listen to it and the track works to a relationship with an artist. And this does happen where they end up working with the artist as a composer doing bespoke music. And, you know, this is a you know, this doesn't happen that often, but the potential of being inside of a production at some point, because those things do happen, but they'll never happen without building a relationship. And st the start of the relationship means being able to, for me, uh, tell people about the artist. Plus, it's just good for us to know, you know, it gives us more information about who you are. So those are the things that we need to get started. Um and then, you know, outside of that, uh, we just need to know the basics, like who's your PRO if you have one and you should have one. Um, who's your publisher if you have a publisher? Who's your label if you have a label? Who's your manager if you have a manager? So that we know who the business points are or aren't. So that when we have a question, we're able to get it done quickly and efficiently on your behalf. Awesome. Yeah, I think you totally clarified it there. So yeah, that does make sense. Um, if anybody wanted to reach out to you, I know you had your syncsummit.com slash blog. I think that's where you, that people can find the blog. But if people want yep. to find out more about you or your sync agency, and what's your sync agency called, and where can they find the out more information about that? Yeah, the sync agency is called Disconic. And that's, uh, and, and it's, uh, basically it's M, M at disconic.com. That's the disconic address, just the letter M at disconic.com. And, uh, if you want to get in touch with me about sync summit stuff, I guess you could email me there too, but I'll give you the sync summit email address, which is Mark at, with a K at sync summit.com. And that's S Y N C not S Y N C H S Y N C summit.com. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. It can be anything from, Hey Mark, how are you doing? doing how do I get to work with you to you know hey Mark you know I had this deal come through is this something I should avoid to hey you know I, I just uh, I, I'm just trying to figure out like uh, how do I learn more about this particular music supervisor and their projects I'm open to any and all questions that you have I really do like being an advocate for people I really do like trying to help people. I'm not always out there asking you to give me money. I will answer a lot of questions without doing, you know, without like putting my hand out because I want you to, I want you to succeed. And I think that the only way that we all succeed is by helping each other. And you, you know, at the end of the day, what I say to people is that on the business side, there's not enough focus on the artist. And without the artist, there isn't a business. And 
people need to take the artist's concern seriously. And I really try to do that because if we don't help artists to thrive, then the whole business falls apart. And I really believe that. I believe that there are way too many people out there who aren't trying to build the business on a holistic level and keep it growing. And they aren't looking out for the other people that they're doing business with. So, you know, that's something that you know, I think that conversations like this can help to change. And, you know, that means that, you know, I want to be there for you as much as I can be there for you to help you to navigate where you need to go, even if we don't end up working together, even if you don't end up coming to a SYNC Summit. I really want to help you as much as I can to navigate the difficult parts of this business. So please get in touch with me. Awesome, man. I know we'll probably do more um, episodes in the future. There are so many topics that we just touched Absolutely. the surface on. So hopefully yeah. we can do this a couple more times. Thank you so much for your time today, Mark. I really do appreciate it. And I think just what you said there was so powerful that you're right. The, the artist, the music is always the last thing on the budget. It's always the last thing anybody cares about. Nobody's really considering. And I do want to say for you guys watching and listening uh, to this podcast, don't ever, I don't think it's it's a wise move to go to the business side of things and say, hey, you need to look out for us. You need to change this. You need to advocate for yourself as an artist because nobody's going to look out for your, your interests more than you are, right? And I always say that to people right. that um, are trying to pitch their music, um, they're like, well, it's just not fair that this and this and this. Okay, great. Life hasn't been fair since we were three years old and your older brother got two extra ice cream cones than you only got one, okay? So life has never been fair. So let's just get that out of the out of the way. But I think that the one thing that we can do, and certainly with a uh, conversation like this and what Mark is doing, which is why I wanted to bring him on here, why I like what he's doing, um, is we are really sort of educating artists to advocate for themselves, stand up for themselves, not sign bad deals, not get taken for a ride by some of these predatory offers that are out there. So the more that we can keep these conversations going, the more you guys can help me uh, spread these kind of conversations, the better we're going to be looking out for each other. But it really comes down to we have to take responsibilities for ourselves, especially as composers, especially as artists. We have to look out for our own interests. So I hope in this conversation you guys are now much more equipped to be able to do that. And now we have more um, insights into how to succeed particularly with sync licensing. So again, Mark, thank you so much, man. Hopefully we can have you on again in the future. And I definitely will give you guys the rundown of Sync Summit LA this year, let you know what I think about it um, and whether or not I feel it's gonna be a really good inv investment for you guys moving forward uh, for the following years, no matter where you are. If you're on the East Coast, maybe you wanna check out the New York one. Um, I have a couple of people I know listening from Japan, uh, not too many, but uh, if some of you are listening from all over the world, there might be other places and other summits that you guys can actually attend. So I will definitely give you guys my complete honest review of it and what I think about the um, the, uh, the event as we get closer in the next couple of days. So thanks again, Mark. I appreciate it, man. That's my pleasure. I was happy to be here, Jesse. And um, just uh, great to uh, connect with your audience and uh, hopefully to give them some insights, really. Like one of the things that was super important for me, Jesse, is to really break out for people the good, the bad, and the ugly in terms of sync agency, because there's a lot of stuff out there that, you know, mostly people get exposed to the ugly and they don't realize there's another side to it. So I hope that we've given people a new point of view. Thank you for listening to the Sync My Music podcast. If you enjoyed the show and want me to do more episodes, all that I ask is that you leave me a review on whatever platform or app that you're listening to. It just takes a few seconds. I'll never charge for this podcast and I want to keep it 100% ad free. And your review right now will help me do just that. Thank you so much. Thank you.